Okay, so now we have access to the full O1 model from OpenAI. As part of their 12 days of OpenAI, these models are designed to spend more time thinking before they respawn and supposed to have much better reasoning capabilities compared to the previous version. They are pretty great at reasoning, but are not really reliable. In this video, we're going to look at two different set of tests. The first is going to test its reasoning capability, and the second is going to be the coding abilities. To test its reasoning capabilities, I'm going to be using this misguided attention repo on GitHub. Link is going to be in the video description. This is a collection of prompts to challenge the reasoning capabilities of large language models in the presence of misguided information. They're using slight variation of the commonly known thought experiments, riddles or paradoxes, or trick questions. Now, in this case, the models are supposed to use their logical deductions to reach the answers, but most of the NLMs will mistakenly recognize the unmodified problems due to frequent occurrences in their training data. I have tested this on some of the other frontier models, and they suffer from the same problem. Now, even though O1 is better than the previous versions, but it still suffers from the patterns it has seen in the training data. I'm not going to be testing the O1 Pro because I think that is geared towards a very different set of people. In most cases, O1 will suffice for your applications. Okay, so let's uh, start with a modified version of the famous trolley problem. So imagine a, run, a runaway trolley is hurling down a track towards five dead people. These five people are already dead. You sit next to a liver that can divert the trolley onto another track where one living person is tied up. Do you pull the lever? Okay, so f I thought for a few seconds. And if you look at the thought process, it says, I'm curious if the trolley should be redirected since the five uh, people are already deceased raising question about the moral and practical implications. So it actually is smart enough to identify that the five people are already dead. And that's why it says this particular scenario presents a surprising twist on the classic trolley problem by replacing the usual group of living people. The traditional version of the thought experiment pit the moral decision maker against a dilemma, sacrificing one person to save five. In those familiar cases, each um, track has living individuals and you weigh the reduction of harm against the direct cause of, uh, causation of a death. Now, it's able to identify that it's a variation of the uh, classic trolley problem. So this is pretty great, great because it's paying attention to the details. Now, in some of the other uh, questions or prompts, it doesn't do that. We're going to look at a few examples later in the video. So it says, on the main track, there are five dead people. They can't be saved because they are already deceased. The trolley continuing on its current uh, path will harm no living beings. It will simply run over five corpses, which is a, dest uh, a destructive but not a lethal act. And on the alternative track, there is a single living person tied up, right? So at the end, it comes up with a conclusion, no, I would not pull the lever. And this kind of gives you a glimpse of the intelligence that the O1 type of models can have because not only just they use the next word prediction model, but they creates a stream of thoughts and based on that stream of thoughts, it tries to come up with the optimal solution. And here's another perfect example. So it's a modified version of the famous Monty Hall problem. There are three doors behind one, there is a car and behind the other two doors are goats. And you don't know uh, what's behind the door you get to choose one door and then you pick door number one. The host, Monty Hall, who knows what's behind uh, all the doors, open door number one. So it, he opens the same doors, door the one that you chose and reveals a goat. Now you have two uh, options left. You choose between door two and three. So you pick door three, Monty gives you a choice. You can either stick with your original pick, that is door number three, or switch. So what should you do? Okay, so for this one, it thoughts for about 11 seconds. And here is the summarized version of its internal thought process. So pulling back the curtain, actually it thought about its uh, similar to Monty Hall problem, but with a, a twist. So it is able to identify that there is variation. And based on that, it's able to adjust the way 
is going to think about the problem, which is pretty neat. So it says this scenario appears to differ from the standard Monty Hall setup. So let's carefully break it down step by step. Now, first it talks about standard Monty Hall problem setup that you pick one door, but remains closed for now. Monty Hall, who knows what's behind every door, then opens one of the other two doors. And in that case, the probability that being correct is one by three. So you actually uh, need to switch because if you switch the door, your probability goes higher by two by three. Now, in this case, uh, you pick door number one, Monty uh, opens door number one. So you're left with two other uh, options, which is door two, two and three. And you can pick either of the door because behind one of them is a car and behind the other one, uh, there is a, a goat now. So there's no probability edge um, akin to the classic Monty Hall scenario because Monty revealed your chosen door. The remaining two doors stand equal footing. You have no additional information skewing the probability. And thus, you're essentially facing a 50-50 guess, right? So it doesn't really matter whether you uh, switch or not. So this is pretty smart. Uh, it's actually able to look at the uh, variations that we have introduced and take care, take that into account when it's generating the answers. But that's not always the case. Now, here's the one on which it struggles a lot. Imagine there's a small town with a very particular barber. This barber has a unique rule. He shaves all the men in the town who visit him. Does the barber shave himself? Now, it's a slight variation of the original barber paradox. And here it says this is a classic logical paradox often attributed to Bernard Russell, generally known as the barber paradox. The paradox is formulated as follows. And you can see it's simply looking at its training data right now. The barber is a man in the town, which is correct. And the barber shaves every man in the town who does not shave himself and only those men. This is part of the original barber paradox. The one that we presented has absolutely nothing related to this part of the rule. Now, then it goes on to say that the question, does the barber shave himself? So assume the barber does shave himself. If he does, then by the rule, he should only shave men who do not shave themselves. But since he shaved himself, that means he shaved someone who shaved himself, right? So it's basically trying to answer the original barber paradox rather than the variation that we have introduced in here. And actually ran the same scenario twice just to see if I'm going to get a different answer. But in both cases, it simply looks at the original barber paradox by completely ignoring what we have in here. Now, here's another example, which is even simpler. A farmer is on the one side of the river with a wolf, a goat, and a cabbage. When he's crossing the river in a boat, he can only take one item with him at a time. The wolf will eat the goat if left alone together, and the goat will eat the cabbage if left alone together. How can the farmers transport the goat across the river without it being eaten? Now, it's a very simple process because he can take one animal with him or one item. He should just take the goat with him. But the model, by looking at its training data, comes up with this very complex sequence of steps. So it says this is a classic logic puzzle known as the wolf, goat, and cabbage problem. The trick is in the order of transport and the occasional return trip. So here's a valid sequence of moves. Take the goat first, which should be the end of the steps, because that's what we want. But then it's, it goes on to the next step, which is return empty-handed. So basically, now you have the wolf and cabbage. Goat is on the right side. Then take the wolf next. Bring the goat back with you. Then take the cabbage across. And then come empty-handed. And then take the goat again, right? There was absolutely nothing in relation to uh, the wolf and the cabbage. We were not concerned about taking them to the other side. Our only concern was the goat, but you can see by looking at its training data, it completely ignored our instructions and then it gives us the solution, which is over complex. Now, if I introduced a simplified version of this, so there's a man, a sheep and a boat with space for one human and one animal on one side of the river. 
and then how do the man and the sheep uh, go to the other side of the river? So in this case, since there is only a man and a sheep, it's actually able to just tell us that put them together in the boat at the same time and you will be able to go across. Now, here's another classic one. I have a six and 12 liter jug. I want to measure exactly six liters, right? So again, it ha it decides to go through multiple steps, but I think it can be done in a single step that you just pour water into that six liter jug and that will have your quantity. But here it says, fill the 12 liter jug fully from the water source, pour water from 12 liter into the six liter jug until the six liter jug is completely full. And at the end, you're going to have a, a full six liters because when you subtract that six liters originally from the 12 liter, you're left with six liters, right? So you can see that it's smart enough, but in most of the cases, I think it's looking at memorization rather than coming up with original thoughts. And I have found this misguided attention approach to be very robust if you want to actually understand the reasoning capabilities of a model. So this was a quick example of testing its reasoning capabilities. I haven't looked at the O1 Pro yet. It might perform better, but I'm going to report those results when I'm able to test it. Now, let's look at a couple of coding examples. This is the one that I used to test and most of the smaller models would struggle. But I think now these models are pretty good. So write HTML code for a website in a single file with the following features. There's a button in the middle. When you hit that button, it's supposed to show you a random joke. And then it's also supposed to randomly change the background of the page and introduce a random animation. So this is a test that should be pretty simple for to do. So here's the code that I copied. And here are the random jokes that it introduced. Now here are the jokes that it created. There is a joke regarding atoms. For some reason, these LLMs always do that. And the web page interface is here. So if we click on it, we do see a joke and it changes the background color, right? So a very simple task that it was able to complete without any issues. Now, the second one is a little more complex. So here I want it to create a HTML based web app that takes input from the user in the form of a text, I have a message. And then it's supposed to generate an image based on the text description using an external API and display the image to the user. So when the page loads, there needs to be only one text input box in the middle of the page saying, imagine something. And when the user submit the text, then it's supposed to use the replicate API to use the flux model. After generating the image, it's supposed to add two more buttons at the bottom. One is to regenerate and the other one is to download the image. Then I provided documentation regarding the Flux API of how to access that model. And I'm also telling it to provide detailed documentation on how to run the app. Another thing which I usually ask these models to do is to create the structure of the project and then provide a bash command to create the project structure for us. So here, this is the structure that it recommends to use. So there's supposed to be a root folder. Within that, it, there are supposed to be two other folders. One file is app.py, the other one is requirements.txt. And then it gave me this bash command to recreate that whole structure. So let's try this out. Okay, so I'm going to just copy that bash command. We're going to run it and it created this new folder called my app. There's app.py file, requirements.txt file, and in the front end, there are two other files. So I'm going to just copy the contents of the file that it recommended, and we're going to go from there. Okay, so in terms of files, we have the uh, HTML index, that's the front end, then CSS for styles, then we have the back end, which is the app.fi. Here, we need to set our environment variable for replicate API token. So I need to do that. And it also told me which are the different packages that I will need in the requirements.txt file. We'll just need to adjust these package versions that it has indicated here. So first we need to export our API token. Then we need to install everything and then just run that app.py file. 
I have created this virtual environment, which I think has everything that we need. So first I just need to set my environment variable. So here's the Python documentation that we used for our app. Now, in this case, all I need to do is just copy my API token, paste my API token here. All right, so we are inside the backend folder now, and then I just need to run the app.py. This will start the backend server. The port is already in use, so I just need to modify the port or actually kill the other process. So here's a quick trick. If you want to find a process that is running on a specific port, to get which process is using this port, you can use this command. It tells you the process ID which is using that specific port, and then you can kill it using the kill dash nine command. But in my case, I'll simply modify the port number to port 5001 rather than using the 5000 port that it recommended. So now you can see that the process is running at port 5000. Next, we need to go to this folder and run that file for us. This is the front end. I'm going to run this. Here is what I'm seeing. The prompt is going to be create an image of a llama wearing sunglasses. Let's send this. I don't think anything is happening. Or maybe actually something happened. On the back end, I can see that it generated a few images, but they're not being rendered correctly on the front end. Here's another image. Now let's see if the download functionality actually works. All right, so I was able to actually fix it because this was my mistake. I did not change the port number here. So now everything works as expected. So if we regenerate this, let's see. Yeah, it works pretty nice. And if you click on download, I think we should be able to download the image as well. Okay, for some reason, the download doesn't seem to be working. So I would say it's a partial pass. Let's see if I can very awkward sitting on a beach. Yeah, under the hood, it's using the Flux model through the Replicate API. But overall, I think this works, which is pretty neat. Okay, so some final thoughts. It's definitely a much smaller model compared to the previous generation. But when it comes to the reasoning capabilities, I think it has a long way to go, especially on a very simple prompts. I don't think it's consistent because it can miss very simple things in your prompt and just fall back on its training data, which is a behavior very similar to humans. Because if you have seen some patterns multiple times, you don't really think a lot and will potentially come up with the previous answer from the memory. But this is not something which we want to see in a system that we're going to put in production. So if you want to use something like O1 in your production environment, I will highly recommend to test it out on multiple different edge cases to ensure that it's not just ignoring part of your problem because it has seen something similar before. But in general, I think it's a step forward and it's great to see the progress that we're making, especially even in the open source reasoning models, especially the one from Quinn. I hope you found this video useful. Thanks for watching and as always, see you in the next one.